Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Vintage Motocross Q&A. I am your host, Joe Abadi. Thank you for joining me. Thank you, Jordan, Chelsea, and Susie for help putting the show together, and thank you all at home who are watching the show. Let's get down to the starting line, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it. The starting line is, of course, brought to you by Motion Pro. In tonight's Next Time Tried This segment, we're going to be talking about flywheel and internal rotor pullers. In the Moto Showcase, Rich Clark sent in a beautiful C&H Rick Joyce replica. Where do you see this bike? And here's the problem segment. We're going to be talking about a couple of different things, and I've also got a little product in there I want to talk to you about, a nice work stand built by Gordon McCaffer. What's it worth? A beautiful 1980 Honda CR250, Fox suspension, front and rear swing arm. Where do you see this bike and the price it sold for? Fritz Gunther sent in another great tape for us for the expansion chamber. We'll be showing you that a little bit later on in the show. Don't forget to share the show, whether you're on Facebook or you're on YouTube. Please comment, Amsoil. We will have a random share giveaway winner a little bit later on, and we've got a new item that we're going to be giving away. It's a nice coffee cup with our logo on it, dishwasher and microwave safe. Somebody's going to win one tonight, so don't forget to share the show. And comment, comment Amsoil. Yes, we are on YouTube, too, and you can see all of our shows from Vintage Motocross Q&A and listen to all of our interviews from Vintage Motocross Radio. Go over to YouTube. Please subscribe. You'll get an alert just like that, and you'll know when we're live on YouTube, and, of course, you'll know when we're live on Facebook. And while I'm thinking about it, there's a professional way to watch this show, and here's what I'm going to suggest. I'm going to suggest that you watch Vintage Motocross Q&A on YouTube from your big screen TV. If you've got a smart TV, it's a really great way to watch it. Also, you could sit there and watch it on your TV, but you can comment from your phone because watching it on TV and commenting that way could be a little bit of a pain in the butt. But if you're sitting there watching your big screen TV and you've got your phone on, you can comment through Facebook and catch the show on your big screen live in HD on YouTube. I want to thank our sponsors, Motion Pro Vinco. Full Circle Racing, Preston Petty Products, Northwest Mako CZ, Amsoil, and I want to welcome Racer X into the group tonight. This week's Next Time Try This segment is brought to you by Vintco. Keep the ride going. Today, I want to talk to you about flywheel pullers. We've all been there in different situations. Sometimes this is the wrench you reach for when you really don't want to go over to your toolbox and reach for a wrench. And this, well, you've used it for a pry tool and so have I. But when it comes to flywheel pullers, there really, really is no substitute. I want to talk to you today a little bit about that, how they work, what to look for, how they're going to prevent damage to your crankshaft and other parts of your engine, and why you should go out and get the right flywheel puller for the bike you own. The first thing I'd like to mention is to determine what type of flywheel or rotor you have. You may have one like this where the threads are external on the flywheel, or you may have one like this where the threads are internal. In either case, you're going to have to look for the right type of puller. This one has the threads internally. That is for your external thread flywheel. This one has the threads externally. That's what you're going to need to pull off a flywheel like this or a rotor that has the threads internally. Now, whether you have an external thread like that or an internal thread such as this one, the premise is the same. When you run this bolt in, this piece right here is going to hit the end of your crank. This section is attached to the flywheel itself and it's going to pull itself off after you run down that bolt. Same one here. This is a little bit of a better quality puller. Uh, it's got threads on both sides, so you could use it in two different applications, but it's the same way. There's a little point here on the end of it. Many times on the end of your crank, you're going to have a little hole like that where that little tip sits, and you're going to spin it in, and it's going to put pressure against the crank, and this section is going to pull your rotor or flywheel off. Here's another example of a type of puller. It's a little more old-fashioned, and what you'd be looking for is on your flywheel like this, there may be two holes that are threaded and there it's tapped in there. They're threaded, they're probably eight, maybe a 10 millimeter hole. In that situation, again, you would just take this with the same premise, it would sit on your crank, but you would have two bolts. One bolt would go here, one bolt would go here. You tighten them up against your flywheel. You'd spin this center shaft and it would pull up the flywheel or pull it off of the crank. 
Here's another example of a more generic puller. This type of a puller was sold in an auto parts store and it can be used for removing a variety of different things, not just the flywheel, external or internal, but sometimes it can be used to pull bearings and things of that nature. This happens to be a two jaw chuck. Sometimes they come with three, sometimes they come with four. The problem is many times this rotor is sitting inside your engine case and these jaws will not be able to get behind an internal flywheel like this or internal rotor in order to get it off. So while this may be handy in some cases, it's not really that uh, universal as, as you may think, and it may not work on your bike. So remember, the first thing you want to look for on your bike is, do you have an external flywheel? Do you have an internal rotor? Is it a left-hand thread or is it a right-hand thread? You may need to go online or go to your manual to figure out exactly what you have. Then Go to a reputable company, Vidco is a great one, and get yourself the correct flywheel puller or internal rotor removing tool that you need for your bike. Well, that's it. That's my tip for this week. I want to thank Vidco for all their support for the show. Vidco, keep the ride going. In the Moto Showcase tonight, which is brought to you by Preston Petty Products, we take a look at a 1977 Suzuki RM125B that was sent in to us by Rich Clark. This is a Billy Joyce team replica, and Rich Clark really uh, really went a little outside the box with this one. This is not a bike that really is familiar to a lot of people. I'm going to read to you a little bit about what Rich Clark told me, and uh, he first wants to thank uh, Bill Mac uh, Mike McAtee for his guidance and support, and um, he writes to us about this bike. This is one was a bit of a challenge, as there just wasn't much info on it out there of, the, of Billy's team bike, but after a year or so of doing some research, and gathering, I felt confident that I could replicate it, and I did the following things, less the CNH motor rebuild. The engine had an extensive machine work done to it. It was built to 139 cc's. R&D ported cylinder, cylinder and piston and head mods uh, by Performance Dirt Racing. CNH industry pipe, NOS CNH Industries twin plug porcupine head, Kernut shocks, Al Baker four kit, CNH industry swing arm. NOS Mototech Ignition did rims with Buchanan spokes and NOS Super Digger rear tire, NOS IRC front, Magura controls, new OEM cables, bearings and seals from the back to the front, top to bottom, custom decals and graphics were done by Christian Moist, Clark original center fill fuel tank, powder coated frame and hubs, fresh top end, bottom end using all OEM parts and a new OEM clutch fibers and clutch plates. As you could see, which Clark did a phenomenal job on this bike. If you get some time, you can go look at it online and get some real, uh, get a real close look at some of the details he's put into this bike. I can see him real clearly here in this picture, and I can tell you, it's uh, it's a real nice piece. And once again, Rich Clark has sent us in something rather unusual. He sent us in some motocross Fox bikes before and a few others. And I want to thank Rich Clark for sending us in this 1977 Suzuki CNH Industry replica. Preston Petty Products is sponsor of that segment. If you want number plates, lighting, fenders, plastic kits, grips, and more, be sure to visit Preston Petty online at PrestonPettyProducts.com. I want to thank Paul Standard for all he does to support this show and, of course, Vintage Motocross Radio on Sundays. And here's the problem segment, which is sponsored by Motion Pro. We're going to take a look at some of your questions, and uh, hopefully I'll have some answers for you that, uh, that will enlighten you. Jordan, what do we got first? Philip Joe, how do I ensure a correct match on the gold anodizing of a 79 KX125? Is there a code like there is with paint? Well, I'll tell you, Philip, there is a code, and it comes along with, with a plate that looks like this. Now, I went through this with my anodizer one time, and you asked me if there was a code because, yes, there is, but you couldn't find the code for Kawasaki because Kawasaki didn't keep a code on that. That's why you can't find one. So... What you would end up doing is trying to find a piece that matches the uh, the original gold anodizing that was on a rim. On a 1979 KX125, the motor mounts are also gold anodized, of course, swing arm and the rims. What you would do is, after you get those parts polished, you're going to take them to your plater, and he's going to have a chart just like you saw earlier in this segment. So when he tells you he can do it, he's going to probably tell you that he can get it close. And there's going to be a variety of colors there, and he's going to get one that's real, real close to that. So there isn't really a code, but when you have uh, a, a sheet like this that has different different uh, colors on it and different shades, 
you're going to wind up finding something that's very, very close. What you really want to make sure that you have is something that's original, that isn't um, faded, that you can take with you um, to, your, to your plater, to your anodizer, before you get that work done. And don't forget, polishing is a huge part of getting a really, really good anodizing job. Also, something else I want to mention. If there's a color gold that you want to make a little darker or something, when they make a mixture for that color, it's very much like dyeing an Easter egg. How long they leave it in there or how many times they dip it will change the color of that part. It's not just a matter of submerging it into a tank and pulling it out. So keep that in mind and you can ask your anodizer about that when you go to have those parts redone. When was that mixture made? Uh, if it's something that was just made today for that part that you're doing, it could make a little uh, difference with the variation of the color. Bill Job, I hope that answers some of your questions on anodizing. And Walker, Joe, I really enjoy the show. Thank you for all you do. You're welcome, man. Thank you for watching. Can you suggest a place to buy a quality stand for a downpipe bike? I can. The guy's name, who you want to look up on Facebook, is Gordon McCaffer. Now, here's one of Gordon McCaffer's stands underneath the beautiful bike that was built by Anthony DeSantis. I have used Gordon McCaffer stands for over 20 years. I have some that I got from him originally 20 years ago. They're still standing up. They're as good as the day I bought them. Even Terry Good uses some of Gordon McCaffrey's stands on some of his factory works bikes. Here's a good picture of it. Why I love a McCaffrey work stand is Gordon is a certified welder for over 40 years. He knows vintage bikes too. He was a racer. He knows what he's doing when he builds a stand like this. He's got a nice little curve on that handle now. He puts a grip on it. Everything is TIG welded. It's adjustable, not only horizontally, but also vertically. Get a hold of Gordon McCaffer on Facebook. He'll make you a stand just like that in a variety of colors. He does have them powder coated as well. He can even match frames. I know recently he had one made for uh, a Hodaka blue frame, a Super Rat with a blue frame. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer to make a custom color. But if there are really stock colors, more popular colors, red, silver, black, you can get them done relatively quickly. If you want more of a custom color, it may take an extra week or two because that's the way he and his powder coater work together. But if you want one in a standard color like this, you're going to get exactly what you want, ship quickly, and it is an absolutely amazingly durable little stand. As I said, I've had one for over 20 years. I have a couple of them here in the shop, and we're going to be getting some new ones here on the show too in the very, very near future. Gordon McCaffer is the guy you want to see. And Walker, thanks for the question. Todd Bailey, I want to upgrade the forks on my 1979 Honda CR250. I'm considering Simon's forks, but prices seem to be all over the board. I'm wondering if it's worth the trouble and expense. Any thoughts? Well, Todd, yeah, you know, as prices are going up again, like they were in 2008, 2009, things are getting a little out of hand. And when you get guys that have a fully rebuilt set uh, with the bottoms that have been painted, with the stickers on them, the chrome is good, and the triple clamps, they can, you know, I've seen them out there for $1,500, $1,700, $2,000 in some cases. Are they worth it? They're worth it if you're going to build a replica of a bike that had Simon's forks. Maybe some of your Fox bikes early before they had Fox forks had Simon's forks on them. Some of the other ones too. Some of the Hondas uh, from the factory had some of those Simon's forks. Are they worth it performance-wise? I'm going to give you a little tip, okay? And this is this is really good information. What you want to do is you want to get a set of 43 millimeter forks from a 1982 Honda CR450, okay? You can use the triple clamp. The stem is a little bit longer, but it will go right into the frame of your 1979 CR250. The stem is a little bit longer. Um, and uh, in other words, when, the, when it's longer, the stem, it's not threaded all the way down to the top of the triple clamp. So you need to make a little spacer to go to cover that unthreaded part, and then you'll be able to run your top nut down and put everything together real nice and tidy. Another thing you're gonna get out of this is, not only are they 43 millimeter, 43 millimeter, not 38, you can get a double leading shoe front wheel with that bike, if you so choose. Now, if you top all that off with a Race Tech emulator kit and springs, you're gonna have a set of forks that are absolutely incredibly amazing. I've done this on a CR250, I've done it on a 125 also. That race tech kit with the emulators and springs along with 43 millimeter forks from that 82 or 83 Honda, you're gonna have a really, really great setup, okay? And by the time you're done, you're not gonna be spending anywhere near 1,500 or 1,700 bucks. 
You have a lot of money left over. You have a better performing set of forks if it's for a race bike. If you're building some kind of a show bike that had Simon's forks on it from back in the day, different story. You may have to go for the extra bucks and get the Simon's. If not, and you're looking to ride it, that's the hot setup right there. John Rathjen, Joe, what is your method to use for talking down nuts on a cylinder base? Interesting question. Because a lot of times you cannot get into that area at the bottom of your cylinder. Sometimes the fins are there. Sometimes the barrel sticks out quite a bit. You can get in there with a wrench, and many times it's okay. But if you really want to torque it, and you can see what I'm talking about right down there in the picture with that little red circle, there's the four nuts that go around the bottom of your cylinder. Motion Pro makes an interesting tool that you can put a wrench in as long as you can get a box end of a wrench or the open end of a wrench into that area. And it's got a cutout on top of it where you could put your three quarter inch drive from your torque wrench right on top of that tool after you put that tool onto your wrench. Now, Motion Pro makes a little kit like that. There's also another one that you can buy and it looks a little like this. They look like short wrenches. Okay, and you can see it looks like a box wrench on top. This one happens to be in metric, which is what you would want. And you can get that box wrench end onto that nut at the bottom of your cylinder. On the other end, there's a three quarter inch drive hole where you can get your torque wrench on there and you can torque those bolts in a star crisscross pattern. Something you wanna keep in mind and it probably comes with directions is this. Because you have that extra two inches that are on that wrench, making your torque wrench a little bit longer, if it says to torque those nuts at, I don't know, 22 or 24 foot pounds, that extra length that's on there because of that extension that you're using, you may have to cut back on the foot pounds of torque because you have longer a longer tool, it's gonna to give you more leverage. But I believe that in that kit, you're gonna see some directions that tells you how to uh, compensate for that longer length because you're adding that wrench on to the torque wrench. But yes, it can be done. And that's the way you can do it. In fact, it's the only way you can really torque them because there's no way you could ever get a torque wrench on those nuts at the bottom of a cylinder. Sunday night, rumors began to travel over social media that Mike Bell had passed away. Sadly, it wasn't long before it was confirmed that Mike Bell did die on Sunday afternoon uh, after suffering a heart attack near his home riding a mountain bike. Uh, he was a 1980 supercars champion. He did pass away after suffering a heart attack on a mountain bike in Southern California. Uh, Mike Bell was a longtime factory Yamaha rider. He grew up from a racing family. His father was uh, a fixture at Long Beach Honda. Bell turned pro in 1977, and uh, by 1979, he finished just second place, three points behind Danny Laporte in the 500 Nationals. When it came to 1980, he was untouchable in Supercross, winning just about every event that he had entered. He was a Supercross champion that year. Mike retired in 1983 after winning the Dallas Supercross. He also finished second in his last pro race, the 250 National in St. Louis. Mike Bell was 63 years old. Our condolences go out to him, uh, to his family, of course, and to his friends. He was also inducted into the Hall of Fame. Mike Bell, gone at 63 years old. Hello everyone, Brandon here with Motion Pro, bringing you the trick new Pro Plug sockets from Motion Pro. The Pro Plug sockets are very clever design. They're heavy tool steel construction for durability. They feature a slim skeleton design for hard to reach heads and cylinders. And they feature a really trick, innovative retention system. This retention system is mechanical and it's not a rubber grommet. So you're never gonna battle between the spark plug and the socket. So the socket is always going to be easy and firm to attach to the spark plug, but also it's going to be easy to remove. So you're not going to have to go fishing in those deep well heads to get that socket out. Now the socket features a couple of different drive components. You can use a 17 mil open end wrench, a 3 8 drive socket, as well as a through axle, right? So you've got a couple of different uh, ways you can use this product. Now we have these available in three different sizes. And those three different sizes are 16, 18, and 21, available to fit most model motorcycles, uh, V-twin as well as metric. Uh, retail starts at $21.99 up to $22.99, available from, from your 
favorite retailer nationwide. Another great tool from a great sponsor, Motion Pro. In the What's It Worth segment this week, we're going to take a look at a 1980 Honda CR250, and it's got uh, some really, really great components on it. I'm going to be telling you a little bit about that, but I want to ask you right now, what do you think this bike sold for? Had Fox Forks, an authentic Fox swing arm, Fox shocks. This bike was restored by Dean Amison, who uh, I find to be an amazing restoration guy. I've seen some of his work before. And in the pictures here, you can see so much about what's going on. If you look at the details, he's got some full circle racing rims on there. The paint and the powder coat on the bike is absolutely spectacular. He does have authentic Fox air shocks, a Fox swing arm. And of course, those very, very expensive Fox forks. Those are some authentic items, a very, very rare part indeed. All of the hardware was done on this bike. It is a 1980, um, which has got that double down tube frame in the front. The rims are done. The hardware is done. What do you think this bike sold for? It's got that great pipe on there. Um, any idea? Anybody want to take a guess? Well, I'm going to tell you what it was. That bike recently sold for, drum roll please, $11,000. $11,000. And I think, it was, uh, I think it was a real fair deal at $11,000 because those forks alone are probably $3,500. I know they are. I know they're $3,500. You probably have uh, at least probably another twelve or fourteen hundred between the shocks, the swing arm if you could find it, another thousand between rims, spokes, tires. You got powder coating, paint, and you've got Dean's time in there. Eleven thousand dollars was a real fair number for this bike, and uh, that's just uh, that's just the nature of the beast when you're going to put parts that rare on a 1980 Honda CR250 and do quality work like that. Eleven thousand bucks. That's what it's worth. That bike was put up on the Vintage Motocross Buyers and Sellers Price Guide before it was offered for sale. There was some discussion on it. Many of the people agreed that the bike was worth somewhere between eleven dollars and $12,000, maybe twelve five. dollars There was another bike involved there too, um, but it had nothing to do with the price of what this bike went for. This bike sold for $11,000 and uh, the information was gathered on the Vintage Motocross Buyers and Sellers Price Guide page. I recommend it highly that you go over there and check out some of the information that is shared there every day. There's a lot of great people there sharing information on what bikes are selling for and what they've sold for at auction and some other places too. Vintage Motocross, Buyers and Sellers Price Cut page. In the expansion chamber tonight, that is brought to you by Full Circle Racing Limited. We'll be telling you more about Full Circle Racing products in a little while. Fritz Gunther has sent in a video uh, of a really great tip that he has for us. And I've got the tape right here. And we're going to be plugging it in right now. And you'll be able to hear all about Fritz's advice on how to, uh, well, you'll see it. Okay, right here. Hey, guys. Welcome back to the shop. Another shop tip. When you're rebuilding your engines, these muffin tins, cupcake trays, uh, they work great for putting all the parts in. As you pull your parts off the engine, you can start upper left, upper right, and just as things come off in order, you just put them in the muffin tins. They uh, they work great for that. Plus, uh, if you take the old ones out of your wife's kitchen, then uh, make sure you get her some new ones before you steal the ones that she uses. So, good way to get some points with the little misses. Also, these little squeeze bottles are available, Amazon, eBay. Uh, I forget what they call them. There's a name the lab rats call them, but uh, I just put on the left, I've got, you know, gear oil. I've got two stroke oil. On the right, I've got some soap suds, which is, you know, helps with tires. And also I use it for doing pressure checks on engines, looking for leaks. So just another little tip for you guys. Hope it helps. See you at the track. Great tip from Fritz Gunther on uh, how to keep your nuts and bolts organized in your shop and a little marital advice in there as well. Fritz, thanks so much for sending that in. Jordan, what do we got next? Oh, Full Circle Racing. I was just talking about them just a moment ago. You still got a great special going on for powder coating your hubs. You clean them, disassemble them, blast them, mask them, and powder coat them all for 50 bucks a hub. For $10 more, you can get the brake plates done too. You can request a quote if you want a custom color other than matte or gloss black. Typically, it's about $20 more. It's a one-time fee. Full Circle Racing. Great place to go for all your rims. You just saw a bike there in the uh, What's It Worth segment. Had a set of Full Circle wheels on it. 
Tom McAllister does a great job. In fact, I've got a set of wheels. I just got back here from him for a Harley Baja 100 that I'm restoring. And he's got rims up there for both modern and vintage bikes, lacing and truing. Great guy, Tom McAllister, and extremely, extremely fair when it comes to prices. Be sure to look at Full Circle Racing Limited on Facebook and on Instagram. Tom McAllister, thanks for all you do for us here at the show. In the product spotlight tonight, which is brought to you by Vinco, we've got a great little item here, and it is a Yamaha YZ250 clutch cable. It's also for a 465, just $34.95 from Vinco. Nothing feels as good as a new cable on your bike. Worn or damaged cables can put an end to your day of riding. Properly working cables are a must, and Vinco has the solution. These are all new clutch cables made with modern materials and manufacturing techniques to ensure you a proper fit, probably better than OEM, and in performance as well. High quality clutch cable, clutch cable is 1,320 millimeters long. It's got the OEM part number two, so you're gonna know that when you order your part number from Vinco, it's gonna match what the OEM was from Yamaha. He's got it listed here, and they guarantee an exact fit. So, get that clutch cable from Vinco for your 1980 YZ250 and 465 models. Just $34.95. Vinco, keep the ride going. We got another great item from Northwest Mako CZ. Alan Brown has once again put something great together for us. He's got a really nice air boot that's perfect for you restoration guys who are still uh, putting your Yikov carburetors or Jikov carburetors on your bikes. Now, this fixed the stock Jikov carburetor and the stock air box. Just 35 bucks from Alan Brown. Beautiful, fits perfectly, and uh, it's actually the, the best thing you could possibly use uh, if you're restoring a CZ. Thanks, Alan Brown, for all you do. We're going to take a commercial break right now. Don't forget to keep sharing the show, whether you're on YouTube uh, or on Facebook. If you're on YouTube, please comment AMSOIL. When we get back, we're going to have tonight's random share giveaway. And tonight's prize is we've got cups made, vintage motocross Q&A cups, dishwasher and microwave safe. Somebody's going to get one of these bad boys tonight when we get back from this commercial break. Classic and vintage dirt bikes are more than a hobby. It's not just about the ride. It's about the work that goes in. The work that keeps you connected to the ride. It's about bringing the bike back to life. And doing it with your own hands. It's about the adrenaline and adventure. And when it comes to putting all the pieces together, only Vinco knows the bikes and parts the way you do. Vinco, keep the ride going. Vinco, keep the ride going. Jordan, what do we have up next here on the show? We have the random share giveaway? That's what we have, right? Okay. Susie went inside and uh, did the tabulation. The winner of tonight's random share giveaway is Glenn Buckles. Glenn Buckles. Send us a message. Send it to either Susie or to me. Inbox us. You've won uh, a nice coffee mug. Compliments of Vintage Motocross Q&A. And don't forget... Visit AMSOIL online, the first in synthetic oil since 1973. If it uh, runs, floats, or flies, whatever it does, AMSOIL makes a lubricant for that bike, boat, or plane, and even compressors. Thank you, Russell Waters and AMSOIL. Glenn Buckles, you're the winner tonight. Jordan, what do we got up next? Just how I see it. A moment ago, I had to uh, give you the Bad news, which you already knew about, about the passing of Mike Bell. Now, the other day while I was on Facebook, I saw someone saying that they were getting ready to go riding for the first time in a very long time. They were about 55 years old. They were going to go riding with their grandson. They were talking about what kind of bike should they get. Should they get a trail bike, a motocross bike? And they were talking about all these different things. And the more I began to think about it, where a guy said that he's 55 years old and hadn't ridden for a while, I think the first thing you need to do is probably go for a physical. It's no joke, guys. Yes, the guy on the left in this picture uh, looks a little funny, but you know what? We're all feeling good. But when was the last time you had a physical? I mean, a real physical, maybe even a stress test if you had to have one. Either do that, uh, but don't go riding first because who knows 
it, it, it can be very, very, um, you exert a lot when you ride a dirt bike. And you know what? You exert a lot sometimes even loading it on the truck or picking it up onto a stand. So before you go pull your hair out on what kind of bike you're going to go buy and what you're going to do, go see a doctor and uh, make sure you're in good physical health before you do it. I know that there are guys watching this and it has even happened to me where I have seen people taken off the track uh, after having a heart attack. So it's no laughing matter, fellas. Go get yourself checked out and uh, do that before you get started riding. And that's just how I see it. This week in motocross history is brought to you by Racer X Magazine. You can pick it up on your newsstand now, and they also have it available online. Racer X, great publication. This week in motocross history, a Husqvarna won. Uh, Husqvarna motorcycle won the Swedish brand's first race. One of their brands, one of their first races in the U.S. Uh, was the Imperial Valley Motorcycle Club Hair Scrambles in El Centro, California. Thirty-four riders attacked that race. It was a sixty-mile course. Very, very few finished, but the ones that did right up front, were all on Husqvarna's. At the top of the results, with a five-minute lead, was Don McCarley riding a new Husky 250 Works Scrambler. According to the ad in Cycle News, the bikes would be available for selected racers and dealers beginning March 1st in 1966, and that's when history really began with Edson Dye and Husqvarna brand here in America. That happened in 1966. In 1978, Jimmy Weiner with the infamous paddle tire won the Oakland Supercross on this date. And uh, Jimmy's mechanic, Roy Turner, found out that the track would be made of sand. So they went out and bought a paddle tire for that race. Leonard ended up winning, and the AMA soon banded and outlawed the tire because the roost was so intense, said Bevo 40, the czar of motocross. They got to figure out a way to get this tire to be legal. Countered Ken Howerton of Team Suzuki, that tire didn't make a difference. Weinert was just ready to win. The infamous paddle tire made its debut in Oakland, in 1978 with Jimmy Jimmy Wire. In 1979, Bell Ray 500cc US Grand Prix of Motocross aired on ABC's Wide World of Sports, even though the race actually took place uh, months earlier in June. The event promoter Gavin Tripp later told Cycle News that the show received above average ratings and maybe even as many as 30 million viewers. Now, before you go from comparing that to today's races, you got to remember that this is back when there were like four channels, ABC, CBS, NBC, and PBS. And anyone who ever rode a motorcycle at that time was probably tuned in and watching that race. 1979, Bellray 500cc US GP. 30 million people, a lot of people watching that race at that, that time. And that's it for this week in motocross history. The next we have the announcements. Racing season is just around the corner and there's a whole lot of things going on. I wanna tell you about some of the events that are coming up. But first, last week on my show, Vintage Motocross Radio, my guest was Steve Wise. We chatted, about, we chatted a lot about a lot of stuff. Steve was on for nearly an hour and a half. We talked about uh, his days at Honda, Kawasaki, his wins as a privateer. Jordan's gonna play a little sound bite for you right here. Let's see what Steve Wise <laughs> There was a, an RC Honda that was a really fast revving bike. Uh, it had a full drain battery ignition. What was that bike about and w what made it so different than, than other factory bikes? Well, that was 1979. You talk about you know, how parts are distributed, the bikes are distributed. At that time in 79, I was leading, I was the leading Honda rider of the points. I, I, I got second in Oakland, I got third in Seattle behind Hannah and uh, 79. And Weiner, Weiner, yeah, Weiner won the Oakland event. So Weiner and Hannah were going at it, but I was third place at the points. I was right there. Mm -hmm. So I was the leading Honda rider. Well, in Daytona, we are in Daytona. I remember this Honda gets shipped to Daytona, and uh, they gave me the bike because I was the leading Honda rider. I was on the you know on the points leading. So, when, of course, we had Marty Smith, and we started, you know, top riders on the team there, but uh, the other guys. So I got the bike, and uh, it was a CR RC 250. It had a battery on it, and it had a longer stroke motor than the, the ones that were normally right at 78. So the motor had, it was more of a throaty, it had a, it was a torqueier bike, mm -hmm. but it was a little heavier for some strange reason. It had a, had a heavier feel to it. It was very, it was very, very torquey. It had very good on hard pack tracks, but on the sandy tracks, where they, I just did, I didn't feel, I didn't like it as much. And uh, I got second on it behind Bob Hanna both nights in the Astronome in 1979, and Hanna beat me by a bike link uh, the second night, and 
the bikes seem great on hard pack tracks, but then we got on the outdoors. It didn't feel, I didn't like to feel it so much around the sand. And then the Supercross that I won in 79 in New Orleans, I went back to the old motor, uh, in the same frame of the old motor, the, the motor that uh, just felt, had a different rev limit, let it limiting on it. Mm -hmm. And it felt, it felt lighter. Even if it wasn't lighter, it felt lighter. And sometimes that happens the way the motor works and everything. The bike has a bit of feel to it. It's, and, and I liked the older motor at that time. Steve Wise, we talked about that. We talked about a lot of other stuff, too. So if you get a moment, go over to Vintage Motor Cross Radio. You can listen to the interview with Steve Wise anytime you like. It's available, of course, on YouTube as well. Stay tuned. We'll tell you who our guest is going to be this Sunday on Vintage Motor Cross Radio in the next couple of days. i got a couple of things in mind. We'll see who, uh, who I'm going to have this Sunday at 11. As I just mentioned a little bit ago, there are a lot of races coming up, and one of the big ones, one of the really, really special ones you're not going to want to miss is the one at Daytona on Tuesday, March 9th. Now, this will be a couple of days after the Supercross in Daytona. So what they do is they make a nice uh, vintage track on the infield with the uh, where, where the Supercross track was. And there are how many? 34 vintage and current classes that you can ride down there. I was talking to Scott Wallenberg today. He says he's gonna have a Monarch there. There are a lot of guys that went last year. 34 different classes. If you're going down there for uh, bike week and you're gonna hit the Daytona race, maybe you can get your vintage bike down there and uh, really, really get a chance to ride in a wonderful place with a lot of history, Daytona. March 9th, that's on a Tuesday. Carolina's the White Lightning race is coming up. It's a national for cross country motocross and trials that will be happening March 12th, 13th, and 14th. Motion Pearl happens to be a sponsor of that as well. That's in Buffalo, South Carolina. So before you know it, February is right around the corner. March is going to be here for, before you know it. So get ready for that trials, motocross, and cross country action down in Buffalo, South Carolina. And make sure you go on to uh, onto their website and also the Arma website if you're an Arma guy and you could read uh, a lot better than you could see it here on the screen about all the events coming up. Another great one coming up is the Mid-Atlantic Cross Country. The 21 schedule is out. They've got the uh, Rocket Run Cross Country coming up April 11th. And you could see all these other races that will be going on all through the year, all the way back into October. So, Vintage Motocross season is right around the corner. Be sure to check out the websites for Armor and any of your independent clubs that are going to start running real, real soon. Finish Motocross Q&A t-shirts are still available, and we've added a little something to our repertoire here. Hoodies are available as well. T-shirts are still just $19.99. Go over to the website. There's a link in the description of the show. You'll find out how much the hoodies are. They come in white, and now they come in gray. A lot of you guys bought some of these shirts, and if you can... Send in, uh, send in some pictures of you wearing the shirt. We'd love to post them here at Vintage Motocross Q&A on our Facebook page. I want to thank everybody for purchasing those shirts, and uh, they're still available. So get them while they're hot. Vintage Motocross Q&A sponsorship opportunities are still available. If you have a business that you're running here on Facebook and you want to reach uh, a much broader audience, please inbox me. I'll get you a sponsorship proposal package. And you can start seeing some of the benefits of being a sponsor here at Vintage Motocross Q&A, where people see the show not only here on Facebook, but they see it on YouTube as well. Get a hold of me. I'll put something together for you that fits your budget, and you can become a sponsor of Vintage Motocross Q&A. I want to thank everybody for watching the show tonight. I also want to thank Racer X for coming on board as a sponsor for the segment that we do every week, This Week in MX History. Great magazine and wonderful people over there at Racer X. I want to thank you all for tuning in. Don't forget to visit me on uh, Sunday or joining me on Sunday at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time for Vintage Motocross Radio. Thank you, Jordan, and everyone watching tonight. What's that? You want to see the dog? Gina! Gina! What? No, I haven't seen your muffin pig. That's what's going to work. Good night, everybody. Thanks for watching.
Thank you.